Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History, the Constitution for Dummies series, Marches Forward, Amendment 16. Guys, true or false, the United States federal government could tax income before the 16th Amendment, and of course you know that's f -f 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 true? That's right guys, let's learn about the history of the 16th Amendment, what it says, what it means, where it came from, and let's see if we can't grow our brain. Giddy up for the learning guys, here we go. We're gonna read the words in a second, guys, but I wanna get kind of the umbrella statement down. And the umbrella statement, if you're in a like an American history course, is the idea of graduated income tax. Um, and basically the way that I have my kids remember it, it's a little bit stupid, but I always say to them, hey, happy birthday, it's your 16th birthday. Oh, I got you some cash, and aren't you graduating high school? Now I know that's a little bit to remember, but if you remember that joke on your 16th birthday, you get cash before graduation. That's the whole idea. Income taxes, the money concepts, of course, it's the 16th Amendment, and uh, the idea of you graduating, that you're you know rising to the next level, is actually the effect of the 16th Amendment. That we're going to have an income tax that's based on basically your income. So the more money you make the higher percentage of an income tax that you're gonna pay is a percentage of your income. So there we go, let's read the words now. Happy birthday, it's your graduation. I got you some Momo, Momo. So there we go, we're gonna read the words. Words are important, let's put them on the screen. Maestro, a little bit of music. The 16th Amendment. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment amongst the several states, and without regard to any census or enumeration. So that's the 16th Amendment, and what the 16th Amendment really does is it kind of changes the meaning of some earlier parts of the original Constitution. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, um, you can see the link below, um, basically says in terms of House representation that that shall be apportioned by census, and it also says direct taxes. So apportionment and direct taxes would be apportioned by census. So of course the question becomes, what is a direct tax? We're going to talk about that in a second. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, which is kind of the laundry list of delegated powers that we give to Congress, includes the power um, to tax. Okay, And we also see in Article 1, Section 9, um, basically a limit on Congress, again referring to the idea of direct taxes having to be related to apportionment. Apportionment is the idea that we look at the census and the direct taxes are kind of correlated to the census of that state. So larger states could have larger direct taxes. That process is very mushy. The big misconception, this is the life alert right here, the big misconception is that the 16th Amendment is what kind of legalized or allowed for income tax in general, and that's just not true. Um, previously, the Revenue Act of 1861 and the Revenue Act of 1862 were not only direct income taxes um, on the people, but they also were graduated. In the Civil War, there was a three to five percent graduated income taxes on salaries above $600, um, and this was allowable, this was, was upheld. However, those taxes eventually expired, um, and without that type of income tax, there begins to be more reliance on the tariff. This is kind of you know, Lincoln and the Republican Party and the idea of tariffs. The problem with tariffs in terms of people that have problems with tariffs is that it taxes goods. So people that rely more on uh, their income and spending that money right away because they need uh, to buy you know, necessities for the house or they're a farmer and they need to buy necessities to farm, yada, 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 are going to see higher prices. The tariff affects them more. During the late 1800s, there becomes kind of a call of action from the populists. Not just the populists, but the greenback movement, um, the Democratic Party, um, especially under um, w uh, William Jennings Bryan, the Socialist Party, uh, the labor movement, all of these kind of uh, people, interest groups from the lower end are calling for some type of income tax. And that happens in 1894. So in 1894, we get a new income tax. This income tax is like 2%, something like that. But someone's going to have a problem with it. So bring on the Supreme Court case. Supreme Court case. 
So in 1895, we get the court case Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust. And Pollock is basically suing the company that he owns stocks in, the corporation he owns in, he owns stocks in, because that corporation is paying this new tax. This new tax is the Wilson Gorman Act. It's a 2% income tax on incomes over 4,000. But what Pollock, and I think Pollock owns like 10 stocks or something, it's, so it's more of a kind of like an ethical thing, I guess. He's against this corporation that he has a piece of paying this income tax because he believes it's a direct tax and it's unconstitutional and the Supreme Court agrees so this is the big deal the big deal is that they're cutting off the stream of taxes that are coming not from income from labor we're not talking about the guy that works at Walmart we're talking about the guy that owns Walmart basically saying that um, you can't have a tax on property. That's been established. That's a direct tax. So the federal government can't have property taxes because that's a violation of Article 1, Section 2 of direct taxes without apportionment, right? Um, but what the court says is, is that income that's made off your property, not your labor, your property. So a corporation, I guess, being that property. So uh, dividends and rental income and any other income other than labor that's made, money that's made off money can't be taxed because that's a direct tax and that direct tax is a violation of the Constitution. So this shuts down a huge stream of income for the federal government. And then at the turn of the century, we see kind of a change in economic factors. There's a rise in the cost of goods. So tariffs are hurting the people. And we also see the development of kind of progressive Republicans like Teddy Roosevelt and kind of the urban centers of the North becoming more progressive, them wanting um, that income stream from the upper echelons of society corporations. So in 1909, Howard Taft gets behind the idea and Congress uh, gets that proposed amendment through and throws it to the states. Remember, two thirds of both houses, three fourths of both states. So in uh, 1912, um, all three candidates support it, right? You have the bull moose, Teddy Roosevelt, you got my big man, William Howard Taft, and you got my spectacle guy, Woodrow Wilson. They all support this kind of progressive idea of an income tax. And it finally comes true in 1913, February 25th, we get the 16th Amendment. Um, it needed 36 states. It got 42 states, and uh, basically what that has been translated into is a graduated income tax. But look, Congress can change that. We can have a flat tax or we can go back to tariffs, but constitutionally now we can tax money that's made off money. And remember, if you repeal the 16th Amendment, you still could have income tax. We established that, right? Income tax on labor. So the working man could still have his income tax but I guess that his boss wouldn't have to pay the income tax. Something like that. I think it's important that when we talk about income tax, that we know a little bit about the history of income tax since 1913. And if you look at the chart, you can clearly see that starting in 1913, with the top rate being about 5, 6, 7 percent, it quickly jumps up in World War I upwards to 78 percent. During the 1920s, the tax rate is lower. This is kind of the laissez-faire administration of Harding and Coolidge, Coolidge and Hoover, um, about 27 percent. And then um, during the Great Depression, we see it jump up all the way up to about 65 percent and then when World War II starts we're jumping up to 80, 90, 95 percent. That rate then stabilizes a little bit down to about 70 percent um, at the end of World War II and then with the Reagan Revolution we see it drop down all the way to around 35 percent and then um, basically fluctuating very close to that 35 percent range through the 1980s, 90s and all the way up to today. Now, there's definitely people out there I know that think that uh, this is a faulty amendment, that the process was somehow tainted, or um, that the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause would bar kind of the idea of a graduated income tax because we're treating people, I guess, non-equally by taxing them differently. There's also an argument out there that the amendment doesn't include repeal language, so therefore it should be nullified or voided. Um, you could throw it down there in the comments. I think that right now most of that has been found pretty frivolous in the uh, court system. That doesn't mean it's not, you know, right. I don't know, but you can think what you want. I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn, I don't care. So there you go, 16th Amendment, guys. Happy birthday. You know what I got you? I got you some Momo. Is it your graduation? All right, guys, you know it now, the 16th Amendment. Make sure you check out Hip Hughes, guys. If you haven't subscribed, just click my face. I'll just pose for a second. And it's like magic. 
And if you haven't checked out the description below, we have tons of links to other EDU channels that you probably should be checking out because there's lots more on YouTubes than just the cat videos. Giddy up guys, where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time for the learning.